since we've got to be finished by 7.30, I'll try and speak as quickly as I can tonight, much more quickly than normal. <laughs> Economic policy in Australia, in whose interests? Yes, I can hear the, uh, the rumblings. Not mine. <laughs> Not mine, I suspect, is the thought that's going through your head. Um, but do bear in mind that there'll be other people who would also be saying, Not mine. I'm thinking, for example, of rich people. <laughs> who might say that economic policy gives too much to bludgers who don't make any productive contribution to wealth creation in Australia. Uh, and I think there is a general tendency for people to think that they do all the work and other people get all the benefits. Indeed, if you take surveys of who, who, who does most of the washing up of the dishes in the average household? <laughs> yes, your hand goes up nicely. Yeah. <laughs> po possibly your husband or whoever his hand might go up too. Uh, uh, in fact, if you add it up, uh, you know, everyone's contributions, of course, they would sum to more than 100%. So there are certain dangers, I think, in thinking that that sort of reflex response I I is legitimate. And also, I think even worse, there is a danger that that kind of reflex response leads to a right-wing populist politics. It's that sort of what's-in-it-for-me view about the economy which leads people to think, I'm, I'm getting the rough end of the pineapple, I'm going to upset the whole fruit cart. Um, and here we go, next step, Donald Trump's your president. <laughs> Well, I don't think there's anything particularly unique about Australia, which means we're going to have sensible politicians. Or if there is something unique, it's about time we got started. <coughs> the second approach, though, going to the other extreme, is, I think, possibly equally unilluminating, though much more soundly academic. Put on my soundly academic... Uh, spectacles for this and so uh, the answer to the question in whose interests is that we don't know we don't know we don't have adequate statistical information adequate econometric models to know with certainty what the incidence of particular economic policies is on different segments of the population. Uh, historically, of course, we've developed very good systems of national economic accounting based on Keynesian economics, which enables us to identify the value of gross domestic product, its components, the balance of payments, and so forth. But we do not have equivalently good data about who gets what. And indeed, there's a very strong case for saying that one of the primary needs about economic information in the current era is sets of national distributional accounts of comparable quality to those national income and output accounts. Uh, and until we get that statistical data set, we're frankly a bit uh, stumbling in the dark to identify the exact connection between particular economic policies and their impact on different sections of the community. Now, Malcolm Turnbull and that lovely Scott Morrison fellow uh, are, are telling us at the moment that if only they can get their legislation for further tax cuts to large businesses, uh, workers will benefit. Well. I think I just saw a pink pig fly overhead. But, uh, I mean, who, who knows? You don't know. They don't know. No one knows. Because there's so many other things going on concurrently in the economy that it's just possible that that might happen. But you, you, to establish that there's a definite mechanistic connection between A and B is, frankly impossible. 
Now, I, I think we could do a lot better in developing our analyses to answer questions like that. A body in Canberra called the National Centre for Economic and Social Modelling has for many years been trying to develop uh, data sets and uh, uh, econometric techniques to answer those sort of questions. And I know Ben, my fellow speaker here, has spent some uh, days uh, a week or two ago uh, with people from NatSem, or at least a former em a worker at NatSem, to try to model the effects of introducing a universal basic income system in Australia and how that would impact in terms of who gets what and, and the overall cost. So we could make a lot of progress. We could have regular equity audits of all government taxation and expenditure programs so that to the best of our abilities using the data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, we could work out who pays what and who pays and who gets what from different areas of government policy. We could disaggregate those according to gender, for example, to work out whether particular policies uh, disproportionately advantage women or men. Or we could, in principle, do it according to uh, ethnicity, for example, to find out if people of indigenous background uh, 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 benefit from particular programs or are adversely affected by others, etc., etc., etc. So I'll take off my... Uh, horn, horn rim glasses at the moment and uh, try to find a happy medium between uh, Donald Trump and the ABS. Yes, <laughs> we gone, thank you very much. I think uh, a different lens, yeah. A political economic lens recognises that we can't answer these sort of questions with complete precision, but that we can use uh, economic, social, political science to get the, the broad picture of how policies impact on different sections of the society. And indeed, there's some wonderful examples of that in recent uh, books and articles written by prominent economists around the world. On the top of my pile is the wonderful uh, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 20th Century, which more than anything else has put economic inequality on the agenda of public debate and public policy. Uh, I really like this uh, man, this uh, Thomas Piketty. I think he's a very good chap. Yes. Uh, but there are others too who've... Uh, similarly tried to raise these questions about who gets what. In Britain, uh, the, the wonderful Tony Atkinson, who died a couple of years back, spent a whole lifetime beavering in a way. Uh, uh, this I'm holding here is the latest of his books, Inequality, What Could Be Done. And uh, locally, here in Australia, well, there's Andrew Lee, the, the Labour MP, uh, formerly an economics lecturer at the, at the ANU, who's written a very nice book called Battlers and Billionaires about inequality in Australia and how different sections of the society have been faring, not just in recent years, uh, but over quite a long sweep uh, of economic history. rummaging around here because in the pile I've got a couple of my earlier efforts, one called Economic Inequality, a delightfully slim book, uh, comparing uh, pick, 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 pick tees with... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's the best-selling book I ever wrote, and uh, I think for obvious reasons <laughs> the price was right. But uh, a, a somewhat more substantial book called Who Gets What, and at the moment I'm currently working on another book with the title Provisionally Mind the Gap, which looks at inequality on, on, a, on a world scale and uh, the way in which it's uh, impacting on the wealthy and on the poor. But just to take the Australian case, um, it, work I've been doing in conjunction with Chris Scheel from the Everett Foundation, uh, drawing on some ABS statistics and manipulating them in ways that are more useful. 
uh, shows that it, currently the top 1% of households in Australia has got about 15% of the total wealth. And at the other extreme, the bottom 60% of households have got about 16% of the household wealth. And there's some quite interesting shifts going on, not so much about the, 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 the poorest part of Australia, which is fairly constant in, in its low share of national wealth, but shifts between a very wealthy and increasingly very wealthy elite at the top 1% and within that the top 0.1% of households getting fabulously wealthy but with some decline in the share of the, the middle group between the, the ultra rich and, and the generally fairly poor. So the politics of that could turn out to be quite interesting in the years ahead because the... Um, the stability, and one might say the conservatism of the Australian electorate, that broad middle class, has depended, I think, upon them thinking that they're getting some reasonable share of the fruits of economic growth. Well, I don't think it's quite happening anymore. The, uh, there is economic growth still occurring, but the fruits of it are increasingly concentrated in the hands of a very small elite, 1% or less of Australian households. And in, in the United States, this is even more extreme. Uh, to put it rather bluntly, over the last 20 years in, in, in the United States and more, there has been no improvement in anyone's living standards other than the ultra-rich. And indeed, on some indicators, uh, the uh, wage earners are s slipping backwards in terms of the real spending power at their disposal. Indeed, this isn't just something that comes from sort of left-wing political economists who are disaffected with, uh, with modern capitalism. It comes from some quite prominent figures within the finance sector. The, uh, the governor of the Austra uh, Australian Reserve Bank, for example, has spoken on a number of occasions about the problems for the economy arising from wage stagnation. And so clearly, if economic growth is to uh, proceed apace, something's got to happen to change those distributional patterns in a way that enable ordinary working people to have rising incomes, uh, therefore rising expenditures, which provide markets for the goods and services being produced uh, by uh, businesses. Yeah, sure, you know, if, if China continues to grow and Australia continues to be a mine, then uh, incomes can be generated by selling them stuff. But bear in mind also that we're buying stuff increasingly from them, manufactured products and so on, which uh, the production of which has gone completely down the tube in a country such as Australia. So moving towards the conclusion of these introductory remarks, I just simply want to ask the question, well, where do we go from here? I've suggested some of the problems, growing inequality, uh, wage stagnation, uh, a share of the national income that's going to capital and property owners, but away from labour, creating problems of underconsumption, and uh, a slowing of economic growth. In other words, the conditions that are conducive to capitalist expansion are not buoyant at the moment. And indeed, uh, one of my colleagues from the University of Sydney, Dr Susan Schroeder, has written a rather nice article in a little magazine called uh, Australian Options, which some of you may have seen, uh, in which she raises the question, how robust is the Australian economy? And her, her answer is not very, because notwithstanding the headline figures that Turnbull and Morrison are want to quote, if you pulled out the proportion of economic activity that's in the hands of the so-called fire sector, that's finance, 
Insurance and Real Estate, F-I-R-E, Finance, Insurance and Real Estate, if you took that out, the Australian economy is going backwards. So in other words, it's only what you might call the money manipulation and the capital gains in residential property markets that, that's keeping the economy afloat at the moment. Otherwise, we're going backwards. And what does uh, our, our beloved political leadership want to do? They want to make more cuts to business taxation. Oh dear, that we've come to this. At least the, uh, the opposition led by... Um, what's his name? <laughs> God, it's funny how you can forget things, isn't it? Bill Shorten, of course. Um, you know, ha are at least talking about taxes on capital that will get to some of the concentration of the wealth in the hands of people who've been making speculative gains out of real estate processes through exploiting the tax loopholes associated with ne negative gearing by t taking away at least part of the concessions that have enabled capital gains to accumulate in the hands of, of people with surplus capital. So I think uh, I, I don't know whether Bill Shorten's read uh, any of these books, uh, although I think probably uh, Andrew Lee's influence has been significant in this regard in steering the Labour Party towards policies that recognise the need to restructure the taxation system so that it doesn't just tax according to ability to pay, but it specifically targets the accumulation of capital arising from unearned income and speculative activities. So I think uh, there is a, a little light at the end of the tunnel. But meanwhile, here's uh, Ben Spees Butcher to cast some more light on the whole situation. Thank you.